Hello everyone, this is Mrs. Brown. Uh, tonight's presentation I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the events that happen in Chapter 6 of All Quiet on the Western Front. And we're going to look at some of the key items and details and some of the techniques that the author is using throughout this chapter. The first thing that we see in Chapter 6 is the same thing that the men see. We have this pre-battle things that are happening and a little bit of foreshadowing that the boys go by and they can see that all of the coffins are ready. There's just these wooden boxes stacked up high. And they're also being served this Edemer cheese, which the men associate with these bad times because it keeps for a long time and it's what they send up to the front. So there's all the suspense that's being set up that something's about to happen. And the author's kind of showing you a little bit of irony here that the German army is very efficient in preparing for death, but inefficient at actually supplying the food and the gear that the men would need to survive in the first place. So they have all the coffins ready, but it might be better if the army was actually well equipped and well fed. And there's also a little bit of where Paul describes the rats that are getting into the trenches and how much they're really troubling everyone. In addition to people just not liking the rats, they're also really troubling. They steal their food, they carry diseases, and they're biting the men as well. So we have all of these really nasty kind of images at the very beginning that are kind of setting you up that something big is going to happen in Chapter 6. And then the bombardment begins, and we see some of the different reactions that the men have. There's a phrase called shell-shocked, which has been used to describe kind of a post-traumatic stress disorder, but also something that happens to people right during the attack, where they're, they're completely numbed by the things that are happening to them, and they're really traumatized by it. Um, the men are very, are very numb. They don't know what to do. They're very isolated. There's so much noise that they can't talk to each other. They literally can't hear all of the, over all the noise of the, the bombs and the shells coming down. They're really hungry because they can't get the, to the food when they're being bombed. They're really tense because they just don't know what's about to happen and when they're about to be killed. So this fear and this just waiting for death, and that's really all they can do. They can't do anything else to protect themselves from these bombs that are being thrown at them or dropped overseas or dropped from overhead, and they're, they're just completely stuck there. You just have to sit there and kind of hope that nothing falls on your head. Uh, then we even see the new recruit who has this claustrophobic attack where he feels so trapped in these trenches are very tight spaces and these things falling around them and uh, just to kind of increase the anxiety and the stress and tension that we see in this chapter. And finally, the men get the order for an attack. So it's time for an offensive, where they've just been sitting there waiting for the shelling to stop. Now they're actually allowed to get up, get out of their uh, trenches, and go attack the other side. And this is actually a feeling of relief for them. After all this time of just waiting, they can actually take some of their fate into their own hands and go out and attack. There's this great moment, too, where Paul is about to throw a grenade, but he catches the eye of the other soldier. And in that moment, they're looking at each other, and it's kind of like that Thomas Hart Hardy poem that we read at the very beginning of this unit, The Man He Killed, Paul can't act because he just sees another person. He doesn't see an enemy. Finally, he's able to break the human contact, and that's when he realizes it's us against them, and he's able to go ahead and throw the grenade and continue his mission as a soldier um, now that his humanity has been broken. In the middle of the bombing, there's some horrific stuff about these people near them, their own comrades who are getting wounded. And in the middle of it, the men can't react. They can't really even notice. It, it's kind of happening that they don't have time to stop or certainly not time to help or comfort. They have to really kind of deaden their own human feelings so that they can continue to fight. It's almost a survival of the fittest kind of bit where the men have to kind of go back to animalistic tendencies and ignore all of these human emotions in order to just keep acting so that they can keep themselves safe. Now, once the battle itself is over, we get just to the practicalities. This is finally a chance to get something to drink. Um, they've raided all of the enemy soldiers that have fallen and drawn in what provisions they can, whether they had food or cigarettes or more munitions to get that in from the enemy soldiers. And now they have time to stop and tend to the wounded. They try to gather them in and do what they can to help them. They even will search for days for this one man that they can hear crying, but they can't find him. And they go out and eventually they hear the cries get faint fainter and fainter until they finally stop. So it's not that, they've, that they're not human anymore, that they don't care. It's just that what the war does to them in order to survive is to get rid of these kinds of human emotions and tendencies so that they can just act on reflex in those moments. But now that the battle's over, they do their best to come back to their, to their comrades. 
A couple of other observations you might pick up from this chapter. We notice that Paul's memories tend to happen in the more quiet, still moments. That's when he has time to actually think about these things, and then we as a reader get a little bit more insight into his thought process and background. Um, then there's this great bit with Himmelstoss, who was their real bully coming out of boot camp. And when the actual attack happens, now that Himmelstoss is at the front, he becomes paralyzed with fear. He, he can't move, he can't react, he's not doing anything. And finally, someone gives him a direct order, and that discipline that he always built into them finally kicks in, and that is what allows him to overcome his reflexive fear of just you know hiding and keeping himself safe and coming out and joining the offensive. We see this interesting bit where a lot of the men who were killed have already been buried, not by their comrades, but as the bomb fell, it made a big hole in the earth and threw the, the, the dirt all up in the air, and that's all fallen back down on the men in the shells. So they've been buried already by the shells themselves. And then there's some interesting juxtaposition of nature. Paul notices that there's butterflies, which seems the weirdest thing to see in the middle of a battlefield, and the birds who are still trying to fly between the trees and sing and find food. And they're trying to continue their natural lives, even though the people seem intent on just destroying everything around them. And the result of all of this in chapter 6, the Germans claim victory. Well, why do they claim victory? Well, they didn't exactly lose, but they only had to surrender just a few hundred yards of land. So they're claiming this is a victory. There's been hundreds of lives lost on both sides. And out of Paul's original company that started off with 150 men, only 32 have survived. I want you to just think about those odds for a minute. There's about 140-some students in the freshman class and in the sophomore class. If out of that entire class, only 32, which is about one classroom full of students, managed to survive the battle. Just how much in real human terms, uh, how many people have actually died in this. So what's coming next after chapter 6 is a time of rest. And if you notice anything about the pacing of the novel, your six chapters in, that there's this alternating, almost this roller coaster ride of this alternating between strong periods of action and moments of rest, even complete boredom. So this idea of war is that you're either bored and kind of hanging around with nothing to do, or you're about to die and you have to go kill somebody else. So that, that complete uh, juxtaposition of those two, two opposite kinds of ideas and emotions. We see that losses come in the action, but the emotions come in the restful time. And chapter seven is going to show two different kinds of rest. You're gonna see the men getting kind of a small break. There's a little kind of mini vacation that they managed to find in chapter seven. And Paul actually gets leave to go home for a little bit. So we see for the first time in the book, Paul going back to his home life, um, back to seeing his family and back to his old um, hometown. And that's what's ahead for chapter seven. But that's it for now and the notes on chapter six.